Hey everybody, let's take a look at implementing a port scanner. A port scanner is a utility which takes, let's say, an IP address, checks uh, some range of ports, and tries to find which ones are open. In this case, localhost is listening on port 25, as well as 631. Our utility is also going to be able to accept a range of IP addresses. In this case, the scanner only found port 25, but has gone and scanned through uh, everything from 1 to 255, and all of the ports 1 through 124 inclusive. Cool, so we are going to learn some fairly advanced Rust. To build our utility, we're going to be looking at three main crates. Clap for command line argument parsing, Tokyo for the network, and the sitter crate for parsing network addresses. Tokyo implies async, so along the way we're going to be learning how to do asynchronous programming in Rust inside a command line utility that is short-lived. This is not the normal way that Tokyo is typically used because it's normally used to create servers. The code is already up online on GitHub, so go and have a look and download it to have a play. Here is VS Code. I'm going to create a new project called Porter. I can now see that inside my directory I have hello world. The first thing I want to do is actually implement some sort of command line parsing. So we want users to be able to specify Porter and then an IP address, let's say 127.001, and for us to kind of print that out. So we need to figure out a way to do that. And the next step is to go into the porter directory and invoke cargo add, and this will, and we're going to, Cargo add is going to take the name of a crate that we wish to install. In our case, we're actually inst installing clap. And I want to also include two other features. One is called derive and the other is wrap help. The, de the derive feature enables me to declaratively create a struct, which is uh, going to define the command line arguments. And wrap help is just useful in contexts where I have a small window, like the one that I'm using for this tutorial, uh, and clap will resize the help output to fit the screen or fit the terminal. Now, if I go into the project again and see its manifest or cargo.toml file has been updated. So I'm using cargo version 4.5 with the features derive and wrap help. Inside Porter's main.source file, I now can use clap and the import that I want to use is parser. Parser is a what is formally known as a procedural macro. <laughs> Sorry about the term. What it is going to do is teach Rust how to take this type that I'm defining, which is called args, and turn it into something that Rust knows about. And I'm going to say address, and I'm use and address will be a string for now. And to use cargo in the way that we want is just I add sort of an annotation to the field. And you can see the empty parentheses here, just because I want to also provide some parameters later on. Now inside main the args has been given a new method called parse, which has actually been written by this parser procedural macro at compile time. So that's where uh, parse is generated from. And I can create a variable under, uh, sorry, lowercase args, which represents the command line arguments. And now, I'm in a position to implement our intended behavior by saying args.port address. 
Let me also show you how to invoke this command. Cargo run will be the entry point that we're using. It's going to go and compile a bunch of code. This will take some time and immediately complain that I haven't specified an address. And the noise here is generated by Cargo, which is our package manager and build system. I can also invoke the compiled binary directly. It's sitting inside my target directory. And here is this error that um, I had before. This BLE thing is just a, uh, a plugin to my shell. Uh, it's just telling me that it was a non-zero uh, uh, <laughs> a non-zero exit code. Okay. So now how do we print out our address? From cargo run and I add two dashes, I can now send arguments directly to the utility that I'm about to compile. And this out the I like that have the output that I've highlighted again generated by cargo, and here is the address that I have specified. Note that we haven't added any sort of validation, so there's no requirement for this to be a valid IP address. So that's presumably a problem. Let's fix that before we proceed. Standard net uh, IP address. The standard net module provides an IP address enum that knows how to be converted from a string and clap can make use of that. Now I uh, should have some validation. Invalid value, the error message could be helped. Uh, maybe we could help that along. The, but uh, at least we have something there. We are informing the user that they didn't provide us exactly what we needed uh, to have a more detailed look at clap. Please follow one of the other tutorials that I have e I've got <laughs> in my playlist. And probably I'll do the, uh, my shiny link thing at some stage in, in YouTube as well. If you're watching a recording not on YouTube, please go and find uh, my clap tutorial wherever you've downloaded this. I release all of my content under a Creative Commons license, so you're more than welcome to d download and distribute any of my tutorials. Okay, the IP address is what we want now. I now need to hook up some sort of network. Um, oh, there are two other arguments I think we'll, we'll start, and we actually want to scan a range, and so let's uh, use the u16 data type it's convenient because all ports must fit within a uh, 16-bit unsigned integer which is exactly what we need and what we're going to add here is the long argument to arg to say that this is a these are arguments that are provided by uh, along the these are arguments which are specified by the user on the command line and we can also provide a default which will have the we can provide a default which will have the effect of making this an optional argument so we're going to set the default value to one and on the inside i'm going to set it to 124 and the reason why that is, is because most services that are listing on the internet that uh, are in these lower ranges, you can un always go up to sort of 65,355. I think that's two to the power of 16, minus one. <laughs> but that's a very large scan. And so, there's a trade-off because it's very easy to get detected. Your ISP is very likely to start getting very angry with you very quickly if you start trying to port scan the internet. Okay, so in in our main again, we're just doing a tiny bit of validation. We're going to say that the start must be greater than zero. And we're also saying that the end value must be greater than or maybe equal to it's hard to know whether or not we want a range of one but well, let's say it's greater than or equal to the start 
this is going to mean that people uh, provide us decent input, which is helpful because <laughs> if they don't, they're going to get very confused because our program will behave relatively errat erratically. Uh, the next step is to start working with the network. To do that, I am going to go back and add a new dependency, and this time on Tokyo. And the features that I want to add are RT, multi-thread, as well as full. The multi-threaded runtime, it will ensure that I can make use of as many cores as my CPU has. Uh, if you wish to run a single threaded runtime, I believe uh, it's just RT uh, for, for runtime, but you can check the Tokyo docs for the right command line. The full feature brings in a bunch of other useful bits and pieces. So I'm using Tokyo version 137, uh, and as long as you're using Tokyo version, major version one, this should work for your code. Okay, now I need to, actually we're gonna try and really connect to a port, make a network request. So the first thing to do is generate a runtime, and we can use the full path in our code. Otherwise, I can go up and add another use statement, which is up the top here. And your preference, whatever's up, up to you. Use essentially rewrites the path to make it unambiguous about what the things are meaning. I get a compile error saying that I have an unused variable. Uh, let's fix that. A run, uh, normally when we use Tokyo, you'll see, uh, this is a bit of an aside, but most Tokyo documentation you will see something that looks like Tokyo main. I've added the comments on the left hand side so that we don't have uh, conflicts with the source code. Uh, I am not doing that here because I want to show you A, that it's not strictly necessary, but also just in case you wanted to configure the runtime yourself, so we're doing the work of that main helper macro ourselves. The confusing thing is that runtime needs to eventually call block underscore on. That takes some future that will eventually complete, maybe, <laughs> if you're running a server, then you uh, probably will never have this future eventuate, but in our case, it will complete. Uh, what is an async, uh, what is a future? It it's something like it, an anonymous function. Uh, in our case, less than that, it's, it's a block marked with async. And this is a hint to the compiler that the block here in blue is something that returns a future. It's essentially a, a piece of syntactic sugar or just some, the async keyword is a convenience mechanism to simplify things for us. But you can think of us essentially invoking a closure in an, anonym, uh, in an async context. Ah, okay, so I have a compile error and that is saying that there is no method block on. And what's happening here is you'll see that my runtime new method returns a result. And to get around this, I've got one, uh, the easy way to do this is just unwrap, which takes our result and expects that uh, there will be one created correctly. There's nothing that we could do if it fails, so we just crash. That isn't particularly polite, however, so an alternative is to return a result object from, from main uh, with the empty tuple, otherwise known as a unit type in the okay, in the okay position. And so now I need okay and then an empty parenthesis or empty parentheses. And what do I have on the error side? So I still don't have anything on the right hand side. There's an argument to be made here for doing something uh, which looks so ridiculously ugly. <laughs> uh, but we are going to provide a trait object. And the trait object is going to be anything at all that implements the error trait. 
from the standard error module. And this a box is a, uh, a type which takes its contents and places them on the heap. Uh, if you're not interested in what memory models are or stack in the heap, just ignore that and say, it is handy <laughs> for, con for dealing with multiple different error types that all needs to be a same size for the compiler. I'm now able to opt in to the question mark syntax, which essentially does the same thing as unwrap, except that it also applies a conversion between whatever the result is, in this case it's standard IO result, alternative into this box dying error thing. We could also return our standard IO result directly ourselves, however, it will prove useful to have the ability to have something that is slightly more abstract and a trait object offers that to us. It's very soon, we're, we're several minutes in, we will actually get to, <laughs> I know what you're thinking, like where's the actual code? Let's create a network request, shall we? And the way to do this is let's actually, and we're going to iterate through all of our ports. So for port in args port start dot equals for an inclusive range args port underscore end. And so, it's, so and for every single one, we are going to Tokyo spawn some future. And what is a future? It, we feel it should be a it should be a closure, but it's not. It's a block. So it's another async thing. And inside that is a, we want to make some network request. And so to do that, we create a t stream. So we're going to bring in TCP stream and remember to use the Tokyo TP TCP stream and not the TCP stream of the same name from the standard library. And then I want to connect and I'm going to connect to args.address on port. And this isn't quite right because this connect method doesn't take two arguments like that. It takes them inside a tuple. And now I need to await. This returns a say stream. Oh, it's a bit, it's a bit grumpy with me but we'll fix that sh soon. It returns a result TCP stream and there might be some error type. So this is actually a different thing. I also get other complaints as well, but let's, let's see if we can fix our way through um, this error, this resulting. We are only going to care about connections that are successful because anything where there is an error indicates that we were not able to connect. So I can short circuit that. We could use a match. We could match on our connection attempt. Let's actually address, create that into a variable. And we could match on the connection attempt. And okay, on error, we could do something instead. So we essentially want to ignore this error side. And to do that, it's if let OK, and I'm going to call this open. So we now have an open stream, which means that we have been successful in connecting. The We still have other compile errors. Let's see if we can fix this one just here. That one's grumpy here too. The, we get a thing around the fact that we're borrowing from port, which is interesting. So I'm just going to subtly fix that. Uh, with uh, a move. So what we're doing is we are telling Rust that ownership of all of the variables moves into the future. And the good thing about integers is that they're easy to copy. And so when there is a conflict, like I will have a port down here on line uh, 28, as well as up here on line 26, it just gets duplicated. Integers implement the copy type, which will duplicate itself in the case of conflict like that. Now we can print out, what should we print out? Let's say I have used this convention that an equal sign and the output means that we have connected 
and let's just print out our address. We haven't assigned it a variable net, so we will need to use a slightly different mechanism. I, normally I would like to say the address would be here inside the braces, but that won't work in this case. And I don't like having things half on the left and half on the right. There we go. We don't actually care about the stream at, at all. The next step after this tutorial has finished would be for you to go and inspect the stream and try and probe it to find out which services are running. That's significantly harder. <laughs> Sorry to give you the hard job. Now, oh, that's not right. Cargo run. Oh, first of all, we still have our um, issue with the, it's not issue. We still have the ability to, our validation still exists. But what I care about is, can I connect to localhost? And it can't. So we don't actually know what it's done. So one thing that we might wish to do is print out what's going on. Because that seems weird. We've written all this code. And we haven't got any. So I'll just add this question mark which means that we we can use the convention that the question mark is working, doing the inspection, and okay means something, we've found something successful. It looks like, it looks perfectly fine. We're spawning a task and running it. What's wrong with that? Yeah, but we, that's weird. So what's going on here? One of the problems that we have is that we need to actually make sure that we await on the spawned task. Um, Tokyo spawn is itself a future. Futures don't do any work if you don't ask them to. That's how Rust works. Oh, I get a grumpy, angry email. This await, this task here returns a result and I'm just going to skip it. And let's see if that changes anything. Doesn't change any of the, oh, you know why? I think I know why. Ah, there's our output that I was looking for. Port 25 actually has our equal sign. So we do the work. We now need a way, but this is annoying having our output in this, let's say it's annoying having the uh, searching output different than the than the successful output. I suppose you could filter that with say some sort of grip uh, or something, but I am going to cheat and say open ports and it's going to be a vector. And that vector will be, and I need to create a mutable or add mutation. And now open underscore ports I can push to it and I'm going to push this tuple that the TP the TPC the TCP stream actually used I'm going to just create a new copy of it and move and now I'm going to move the output to a part in, what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to move it to the end. At least that's what I think that I'm going to do. But I immediately get a problem because, and let's see if we can do this. I, I get ownership issues again. Hmm. So what's the problem here? The problem here from Russ's perspective is that I'm trying to give equal access to this vector to every single task. So that's annoying. And it says, oh, you should, maybe we should provide like a reference. And since it's a reference, maybe we want write access. We, can we do that? So we're now not sending the value itself to every task. Instead, we are providing a read, write, or a mutable reference to open ports. Uh, syntax error over here and almost another move variable. What? 
And it turns out that we're going to need to do something much different than just use a simple vector. We're going to start seeing another mechanism called channels. Vectors aren't very... We could wrap our vector in something like a mutex and reference counting, but by design, a vector is an ex has a is really not something that can be shared between tasks. By itself, it's really there just for a single thing. So what we need to do is create a channel that we can send messages to from any task and collect up inside the main task. Let me show you a little bit about what I mean. Here is the code. I've got this quite strange name, MPSC, which stands for Multiple Producer Single Channel. And I think that it's from with in the Tokyo Sync module. Oh, it says that it needs some type parameters. Because I'm not using any of these, I've got this unknown problem. The type inference engine doesn't actually know what the types of these variables are, and it's a little bit grumpy with me. We'll fix that as soon as we send anything into these, sorry, as soon as we send anything at all into TX and RX, we'll be able to, we can fix that though. As soon as we send anything into TX and RX, we will have the ability, we have a slightly strange error message here. It's telling us we need type annotations. We can fix this though. And we don't even need the type annotations. As soon as we push something into the channels and pull it out or send and receive to use the channel terminology, we are going to find that the type inference engine will be happy again. Uh, one, th one thing I wish to do now is just remove <coughs> the uh, full path from the source code and to do that i'm going to go up here and adjust the imports a little bit oh that's the same compiler error so now instead of pushing to a vector open ports i want to send a message to the where, where do I want to send the message? <laughs> I wish to send the message to the channel. So this is TX and oops, excuse me. So this is TX dot send and then I'll wait question mark, although the question mark won't be as useful right now. So I will unwrap. Yeah, uh, actually, and I'll fix that later. So what are we sending? We're not sending nothing. We're going to be sending our args address. So this is the IP address and the port. The channel has 10 concurrent, it can hold 10 things at a time. And later on, we want to go from the receiving side, rx, try receive. And this won't be quite enough. I need a while let. The while let will say as long as there is so a a successful read or a successful transmission a successful transmission and this is no longer an in it is an equal sign. I pluck out the IP address in the port and oh gosh now we have a whole bunch of horrible muck up here. So the issue now, do you remember how I said that we had this really nice property from from integers and that when there is a an issue with with ownership, they just duplicate themselves. A the TX variable is not the same. It does not implement copy. Let's see here. Move occurs because etc has type whatever that is, which does not implement the copy trait. Hmm, okay. So this is this feels weirdly unfortunate. So we need to send, we need to try something else. And so to get around this, I need to show you something else. Uh, this is going to look very strange. Actually, not particularly strange. I am just going to create a duplicate. And I'm going to shadow the original variable. Okay, 
we now need to fix this. So to get this working, I need to create more copies. Uh, and the way out here is to create a new TX object that is a new clone of the TX for every port. This is quite a cheap thing to do. Uh, it's, uh, but now you can see that every task inside the spawn mechanism or the spawn method has its own channel, has its own copy of the transmission side. You need to create this clone outside of the task itself. If we try and create the clone with inside the block, we suddenly get angry, I think it's confused, or at least it gets picky and we get confused. Let's see if this gets us a little bit further. We should now be able to print out all of the ports that we find at the end. Ah, there we go. There's 25 and 631 at the end. So this is really positive. We have a tiny bit of refactoring to do. One of the, arguably it's not necessary, but it might be nice to actually use a dedicated method or say a dedicated function for the scanning functionality to provide a tiny bit of separations of concerns. So let's say we have some scan function and scan takes an address. Oh, I could even, we could use the tuple syntax or just use IP address and a port, which is uh, U16, as well as the, sorry, the transmission or the sender, sending side of the queue. And this will be a MPSC sender with a type and the type is again a tuple of IP address and port. Arguably we you may wish to create a type alias for this thing. We've seen IP address and U16 exist in quite a few places now uh, but I won't uh, do that for this code. And now I've got to I want to do something correct, but actually it's annoying. Uh, so feel free to treat this as extra credit. The error, so I want to return an actual error. And the error is going to be, it's going to be something that originates from with inside the channel itself uh, because it could fail and it's going to send back a the same type that has been parameterized by the message type as well. So apologies that the, the syntax is as ugly as it is. I now have a compile error. So to, uh, that's largely due to the fact that I'm asking for a result, but my function isn't providing one. So I can give it this okay thing right now. And now I have unused variable warnings. Uh, if you don't like them, one way around this is to just add the to do macro you get a different warning down below but it can help out if you need it we can just suck out the code that we've already written and swap in our so now this becomes scan address port results string tx is different and then we want to wait oh the other thing we need is the tcp stream as well so i'm going to take all of that out and here, instead of unwrapping, I can return the error as I wanted it. I have a couple of other problems. Oh, this function isn't marked as async. And this is no longer args.address, but address. So a tiny bit of refactoring. Never hurt anyone, we said. It's just completely annoying. Uh, results tx is the new variable name. Awesome. That looks happy over here. We have a little bit of work to do because this no longer aligns with our variable names. And because it returns an error itself, I can actually treat the scanning mechanism. Uh, so I can, because scanning returns a result, 
I can check whether or not I was successful. If there is an error here, it probably means that something bad has happened in the uh, in the actual program. So arguably, it's a good time to crash. I'm going to print a standard error with ePrint line and just report the error as is. And it's likely that this will generate 50 messages because or as many messages as needed for the rest of your ports. It's again possible that we could uh, crash here. It might even be worthwhile to panic directly, uh, but uh, I'll allow you to to fix the error handling. Sorry about the code being so messy. The body of our block is uh, this scan section. We've now increased the error handling, uh, factored out scanning to its own dedicated function, and the thing that I haven't done is um, got the tasks to. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're we actually limiting concurrency. I don't know if it is obvious to you, but one thing that has happened here is that we await, we await during the iteration. So we need to wait for every single task to finish before we can start the next one. This isn't particularly efficient. We are reducing our available concurrency uh down to one so i'm going to bring back our vector and this one i'm going to call rename it though to tasks and i'm interested in whether or not there are people with more familiarity uh with tokyo than me to see whether or not you like this pattern or not but we're going to just push all of our tasks that we have into a vector and then join on them essentially. Uh, I know that there is specialized syntax uh, for this within Tokyo, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. And unwrap. Why is that unhappy with me? Oh, I have it in the wrong place. So I'm currently inside main. Main is not an async function. I can only await inside an async context within block on. And if I pull uh, these lines up a little bit further and now hit save again, I should get a another, <laughs> I should get another error. Let's pull our tasks vector into the async context as well. It took me a while. I was using the wrong variable. I was trying to await on the task group itself instead of the individual task. There is a there is a different there are this is a simple way to do what I've done, but there is actually a specialized mechanism within inside Tokyo. Uh, so feel free to go and add the comment in the <laughs> add a comment in the comments once you've found that. I'll be very happy to update the code. And now I've got one extra trick. Before we do this receive thing, I need to drop the transmitting side. The transmitting side is defined up on line 26 here. And the consequence of the drop is to signal to the channel that there will never be another message along the channel. So essentially, you, once you've read all of the messages, you're finished which is helpful for a channel because it wants to know if it's done because it once it's done, it can shut itself down and we can start receiving all of these messages. Um, okay. This should run a little bit faster than just before. And I, and the other thing to note is that, although it's a little bit hard to see, but we should get a little bit of, jitter with the tasks appearing out of order and that will become very apparent when we start to implement the sitter block so this is the last so this is a a tricky part of the tutorial uh, cargo add cidr for sitter or cider i always seem to say sort of 
the complication becomes that we want to be able to allow our users to specify a single one or a set of address. So the, I think the way that I will do this is by showing you how to just use the ranges and then we will try to teach clap either or because this, what I'm a bit worried about is you'll get to this point and get stuck. If I show you how to uh, use uh, ranges without adjusting clap too much, I suspect that it will be the code. <laughs> I suspect that the code will become a little bit simpler. Uh, I'm going to comment out our uh, address and write setter. This is obviously going to um, create a bunch of issues for my code and we're going to have to address those because we no longer have an, an adder uh, field. Instead, we expect that there will be a an IP address range. Here, this loop, this will be extended. We're going to be looping over everything in the IP address range. The validation is actually going to work fine for us. So you will be able to provide anything from a, a IPv4 uh, through to IPv6 as well. And here is uh, it's for network and uh, let's uh, for address in args uh, setter and then it takes an iter method which just returns a a thing called an IP net huh so <laughs> it's not quite what we need we actually need to go in there and map every we have this, a network and what we need is to pluck out the address field. I'm just going to say this is a network and that net.address, it's a method. And now I have an IP address, which actually is exactly the same type as what we already had. Uh, I say, which is what we have on the other side from the command line arguments. Suddenly we have a lot of ports to check. Now let's fix up some variable names. So the address now comes from the range and over here but more or less we should be good to go this code should work and the syntax changes though because a single IP address doesn't really do much but what we really want to demonstrate is the range itself so that we can go through every single IP address and every single port and find out anything that is listening. Interestingly, you've got what you need already because the, again, like I said, if you just specify an individual IP address, the setter crate will do the, do the right thing and give you back a range that only has one uh, network. Arguably, I don't need to show you the next bit, but I want to because it's a really cool feature of Rust and we're going to see trait objects again in anger, let's say. And by the way, the help the help output now looks a little bit more interesting. Where variable has changed to to setter rather than to address. Huh. And the I'm bringing this back. Now we have a problem. <clears throat> uh, becomes slightly ambiguous what I actually mean. So I need to change a few things. And one of them is that I am going to say that my address parameter conflicts with another one and it's required unless you have the other one. So I need to establish a mutually exclusive relationship between these two arguments. And it's impossible or slightly difficult to tell which one I'm actually indicating because I the parser doesn't care and so I need to also say that this is an long argument 
now I need to add dash um, CIDR or dash dash sitter in order to specify it. There is a slightly different problem that I now need an option because it's possible that in fact for in every case only one of these two fields will work uh, sorry will be present. So this becomes difficult for multiple reasons. One we now need to handle the case where arguments are not present and the other thing that I need to do is deal with the fact that these are actually different types but I want to create a range with one type. If I, I'll show you what I mean. I am going to show you a very advanced feature of Rust which is called on stack dis dynamic dispatch. Ooh. <laughs> what is that? What we're going to be doing is creating a trait object as a local variable. And specifically, the, the trait object that we are going to creating, we are going to create, we are going to creating. The a trait object that we are going to create is a, an iterator. And I'm going to say addresses is some iterator. I'll say dynamic for a trade object. Iterator that has an item that produces an IP address. This is the standard library's IP address type. Nothing to do with any of our, sorry, nothing to do with, with, with any of our dependencies. This isn't quite enough though. We can't actually assign a dynamic trait object to a variable. It won't fit. The compiler doesn't know the size of the type. So I actually need to add a reference. So we have some mutable reference to, oh gosh, to a trait object. Now, it's still not particularly happy with us. We've got quite a lot of work to do to get this working. And what we're going to do here is look at our arguments, inspect them, and return a trait object from either side. And I'm going to start with if. I was going to say I'll start with if, if then. <laughs> but I might actually start with match. Oh, no. I'll follow the code that I've already written. So if we have an address from the uh, address argument, then we want to create a vector that contains a single address. It's not the, it's, and we're going to say into iterator. At least this is where we're going to start. We need to do a little bit of extra work to get this to compile, but conceptually we're creating a list of addresses that contains one address and then converting that to an iterator over the addresses. For reasons around lifetimes, I need to actually create the variable that I'm, let's show you the error that gets caused so that you can see how I've dug myself out of it. Here is a, let's say from single, and then, oh gosh, from single, as uh, we're creating an IP address from the single instance, and then it is a mutable reference from single, which is almost should be maybe enough. Uh, I've got a couple of syntax errors, which I should probably resolve so that the compiler, I'm just going to do this, and so that the Type system is happy, and I need to restart Rust Analyzer. Okay, so the syntax error is my fault. Let's fix the spelling. So addresses is some. Ah, okay. Okay, I tried to assign addresses to a type, which is not very useful. Instead, what I needed was the colon to say that the type of my addresses variable is 
the time. Okay, sorry Rust. Thank you for reminding me that I need to tell you things in the right way. Now we have some different problems to deal with. The from single type is this into iter thing, and which is an iterator that can, contains a thing, contains the addresses, and then we want to cast that as a, a mutable reference. And I added the semicolon, which returned the unit type back to addresses. Address, so the equal sign right over here on the right is actually part of the same line as the if let. So it's a little bit convoluted. How about I take the sum of the confusion away and do an assignment. So I've defined addresses as this trait object and I've said that I need to assign it to my from single thing. And that seems to be pretty happy. Now I now need to do something similar for the case in which else if sum and I've got a range of addresses and range is a keyword. So let's say I've got a network of a setter. So if we have some setter and we can produce a very similar iterator that is sitter iter net addresses or address. Notice that this is actually exactly the same code as what occurs later on or when we did it manually. So this is the exactly the same thing that we've produced, uh, produced our code. And now addresses, we can't assign directly to that, but we can use a mutable reference. We have a slightly weird with the type we've expected a boolean. Oh, needed the let in there to tell to tell it that it is a. What do I need to tell? <laughs> I needed to be able to say that it is a pattern match. And the to do macro now is a is feeling slightly redundant. Uh, and probably a better one at this point would be to say unreachable, because it's actually impossible for the code to get here. And potentially an even better way to do this would be to match types directly and pull out these blocks. So the first one here is sum. And then we don't care about the set aside. We know that it's none. And if that is the case, pull out the address. And on the other side, the address side must be none. So we can ignore the case in which we ignore every other case. And we can copy uh, from side our iterator code across from there. And there's one other thing, which is to say any other pattern is unreachable. These are two functionally equivalent styles, whichever one makes sense for you, go with it. You'll probably find yourself using match at the start and then move to a, an if let style in simple cases. This isn't a simple case, however, so I can see you sticking with match. So for address and addresses, for every port in our range, we can do exactly the same thing. Now we should be able to use our scan. We need a mutable variable, which is okay. We can fix that. We know about mutation. We're Rust programmers. Ah, now we're finally getting the, the value. <laughs> we're finally getting the error message that I expected. 
This is an interesting one that took me a long time to figure out. And the problem that Rust is facing is that you're trying to assign to addresses from a variable that exists or might outlive it, or sorry, might not live as long as the addresses. <laughs> Gosh, that's a horrible thing to say. Essentially, once this scope, the match block has ended, they are no longer valid to access. They have been dropped. So we need to hoist them out of here and bring them into, into the parent scope. And now this becomes another assignment. And from setter is that one again. So we have these partially initialized values. That's different than the go zero the zero size, oh gosh, I can't even remember what the, in Go, if you don't initialize a value, you get the zero value of the uh, type. But we don't do that in Rust. You just can't access it until it has been properly initialized, which is what we do. So now address, uh, now addresses all works fine. We should be relatively happy. Let's try our code. Oh, invalid IP address syntax. Ah, it still thinks this is an IP address, not a setter. Okay, so do I have my command line arguments set up correctly? I need the dash long. Dash dash setter. Now we're scanning every port and our uh, IP address range, or at least we initialize initiate tasks all at the same time, and then wait for them all to be scanned, and then print out a report. That is the end of this kind of mammoth tutorial. I hope that you have had a whole bunch of fun and you've learned heaps, lots. <laughs> Sorry if uh, I, my New Zealandisms come through. You're very welcome to subscribe for future videos, send suggestions for further, further videos. If you think of any code suggestions, like a better way to collect tasks that are un underway, just add an issue in the GitHub ticket. Um, repository as well. So that is just about it, except for thank you. I am Tim Clicks and I'm on the planet to build a better planet.